going to read the story of David and Bathsheba. Uh, this is from 2 Samuel 11 and 12. It was springtime. Joab, David's general, marched his soldiers off to war. But the king stayed comfortably at home. Late one afternoon, David woke up from his siesta and climbed up to his summer room on the palace roof. There, the gentle breezes would cool him, and he could look down over the whole city of Jerusalem. As he looked, his eye was caught by what was going on in the courtyard of a nearby house. A woman was bathing, and she was very beautiful. David gazed at her, and the more he gazed, the more he wished that she belonged to him. He called for a messenger to find out who she was. The servant scurried off. The woman's name is Bathsheba, he told the king when he got back. She is the wife of Uriah, one of your trusted soldiers, who is away at war with Joab. Fetch her here at once, David ordered. He did not stop to think about Uriah, who had left the comfort of his home to fight for the king. He did not think about God's law, which says, do not commit adultery. David thought only about getting what he wanted. When Bathsheba was at the palace, David had sex with her. Then Bathsheba went home. A few weeks later, she sent a message to the king to tell him that she was pregnant. David knew that the child was his. That meant that soon everyone would guess that he had stolen Uriah's wife while Uriah was far from home. He must quickly think of a plan to cover up the wrong he had done so that Uriah would never know. If only Uriah was home with his wife, David thought, no one must guess what I have done. So he dispatched an urgent message to General Joab telling him to send Uriah home on leave. When Uriah arrived, he reported at once to the king. David chatted to him about how the war was going. Then he said, Go back to your wife now and spend some time with her before you return to the war. But Uriah did not go home. Next morning, David was dismayed to find that, instead, he spent the night at the palace gate with the king's guards. Why didn't you go home with your wife? David asked him. Why should I sleep in comfort when your majesty's army's is sleep, army is sleeping rough? Uriah replied. In spite of all that David could do, Uriah spent the next night, too, at the palace gates. David had to admit that his plan to bring Uriah and Bathsheba together had failed. Uriah was too good and loyal a soldier. Very well, David said grimly to himself, I shall have to get rid of Uriah. He wrote to Joab, put Uriah in the front of the battle, then retreat and leave him to be killed. He gave Uriah the letter to take to his general. At once, Joab made plans to carry out David's orders. He placed soldiers where the enemy was strongest and he put Uriah among them. Uriah was killed along with many other brave soldiers in David's army. Then Joab sent a messenger to give news of the battle to David. If the king is angry that so many of his best men are dead, he told the messenger, just tell him that Uriah is dead too. David's plan had worked. After Bathsheba's time of mourning for her husband, David had her brought to the palace and she became his wife and gave birth to his son. God was displeased with what David had done and sent the prophet Nathan to David. This is what Nathan said to him. There were two men living in the same town, one very rich and the other very poor. The rich man had a large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except a pet lamb. He raised it and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food and drank from his cup and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. One day the rich man had a visitor. Instead of sending his servants to kill one of his own animals, he ordered them to take the pet lamb that the poor man loved 
and kill it for his guest's dinner. David was horrified at such a heartless, cruel deed. That man deserves to die, he exclaimed. Nathan pointed to the king. You are that man, he declared. God took you as a poor shepherd boy and made you king of all his people. He has given you everything you could want, palace, wives, children, anything more you wanted, God would have freely given you. Yet you had to take your eyes one precious possession, his wife. You have disobeyed God's laws and showed no kindness or mercy. Because of that, God says that sadness and trouble will come to your family too. It is true, David said in a low voice, his head bent. I have sinned against God. God forgives you, Nathan told him. You will not die, but the child that belongs to you and Bathsheba will die. Then Nathan left the palace. Yeah, I, that is just one of the saddest stories in the Bible, I think. I mean, there's plenty that run it close, but it's just one of the saddest. So unnecessary. And um, <clears throat> the consequences of it were far-reaching and devastating, not just for David, but for uh, succeeding generations of his family and, and the people. It's kind of one of those things where you think, just stop now. <laughs> you know, when he's on the roof, perfectly legitimate to be on the roof, cool breeze, enjoying the view. But the moment he saw Bathsheba, he had a choice, and he made a bad choice. He just kept looking. And then he actually decides to find out who she is. I mean, even if she was a single lady, he wasn't a single man. He was married several times. So you kind of think, don't go there, stop now. And then when he finds out who she is, and that she is married, and that in fact she's married to one of his loyal um, soldiers, Uriah, he insists that she's brought to the palace. You know, you just think all the way along, I'm thinking, David, stop. And then even when he brings her to the palace, he could have stopped had he wanted to. So much damage is done before he comes to repentance. In fact, all, you know, it, it, as it transcribes, he moves on to murder and he tries deception and it's only when Nathan comes to him, must have been <clears throat> quite nearly a year later, to challenge him that he recognises what he's done is wrong. What we're going to do is look at a few verses from, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> from Psalm 51. Psalm 51 was written in response to this um, event, this episode. And in the, new t in the NIV, at the top of the psalm, before it starts the verses, it says this. For the director of music, a psalm of David, when the prophet... <coughs> when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. So it's in that context that this psalm is write, written. So Michael, if we could have the first couple of verses, please. Excuse me, sipping. I'm just trying to battle with a, a cough that's um, being rather more than annoying. To you, probably, as well as me. I apologise. <clears throat> okay, it says this. So... It's a psalm of repentance, and it starts like this. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according, <coughs> according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And it carries on in that like fashion <coughs> until we come to Psalm 10, uh, verse 10 says this, which is a verse you're probably familiar with if you've been <coughs> around for any length of time. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. 
a pure heart. Some translations use the word clean. A clean heart, a pure heart. No contamination. No impurities. Not a blended heart. <clears throat> Unpolluted water has nothing added to it. It's pure. Pure gold contains no impurities. Just one thing. Gold and nothing else. Water and nothing else. No division. <clears throat> David was divided. He was a man after God's own heart. The scripture refers to him twice in that way, in both the Old, <coughs> the Old Testament and then the New Testament, quoting that same verse. And the heart, we tend to think of the heart as being, meaning our emotions. But in biblical times, to talk about the heart was to talk about the emotions, but it was also to talk about the, the will and the intellect. So when we talk about the heart and we read a verse like this, give me a pure heart, it means give me pure my thinking pure in the way that I see the world, pure in the decisions that I make. It's more than just me feeling pure. Okay? In fact, that follows <coughs> from the decisions that we make. <coughs> David allowed his heart to be divided, serving God on the one hand, but giving in to his own desires, his own lust in this case, he set his heart, that is mind, as well as his physical desire, on something other than God and something other than godly ways. He embraced his ungodly desires and this led him on a path to catastrophe. I remember learning really early in my Christian life that it was not a sin to be tempted. I used to feel bad even if I'd been tempted to do something wrong. <clears throat> But to realize it's not the temptation, it's our response to the temptation. It wasn't wrong that David happened to look and see Bathsheba. It just happened. But he was tempted to go on looking. And so on and so forth. He decided, it was his choice, to embrace those ungodly desires. Can we put up um, James 4 verse 8 please, Michael? <coughs> Feel free to read that while I'm having a sip. <laughs> Particularly the last bit. Oh, you can't see the last bit. Sorry, I'll read it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> it's a shame it splits there, isn't it? Um, come near to God and he will come near to you. That's great. Wash your hands, you sinners. Repentance, sir. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. I'm really interested that James puts together this idea of purity and double-mindedness, division, blended, you know, accepting what is of God and what is of this world. It's challenging, isn't it? We're in this world, but we're not of it. <clears throat> Purify your hearts. Get, away, get, a, get rid of all division. Get of, rid of all contamination. As I said earlier, just think, David is recorded in the Bible as being a man after God's own heart. None of us is immune to temptation, whether it comes by stealth or hits us in the face. We all have to take our stand. When I um, <clears throat> was growing up, I was a West Ham United supporter. It's okay, they, they've avoided relegation this season, so uh, you're obviously all relieved at that. Probably not as relieved as I am. Um, and when I then came to Huddersfield to go to the university, it wasn't called a university then, but hey, who's, who's taking note? Um, I had learned a, there was a team called Huddersfield Town. Yeah. Now, um, that was really an issue for me, West Ham playing Huddersfield Town, because Huddersfield Town lost in the top league 
um, at that point, they were the last time, it was 1972. So they didn't play each other very often, in fact only once while I was in Huddersfield, until that amazing day happened and Huddersfield Town were promoted to the Premier League. Are you worried for Luton Town? How long are they going to last? <laughs> How long will they last? Enjoy the moment, boys. And suddenly I'm conflicted. Who do I support? Because having lived in Huddersfield Town for so long, by the time Huddersfield Town got promoted, did I say I lived in Huddersfield Town? Anyway, for so long before Huddersfield Town were promoted, I'd kind of got really fond of Huddersfield Town and kind of thought of it as my second team. I mean, I didn't ever win. I didn't play for them or anything. And... To be honest, I rarely visited them, but uh, I mean, watch them. <clears throat> but suddenly I thought, if I go to watch Huddersfield West Ham, who am I going to shout for? My loyalties were very strongly tested. Anyway, I got around that by not going. Um, <laughs> and being happy whatever the result was, because, you know. Uh, well, I can tell you all four results if you want, but no, that would be taking too long. Huddersfield Town did not beat West Ham, I say, but they did draw on one occasion, so there you go. Um, minorities were tested, had to make a choice. may not be the best example I've ever given you, but you take the point. Something you can accommodate to, if I could accommodate West Ham United and Huddersfield Town... I imagine you don't lie awake at night worrying about that, but I can accommodate that until suddenly the two things were brought together and I had to make a choice. And we can accommodate so many different things in our lives and not even realise that there's a conflict. It's exactly as Lynn shared with us this morning. You, you kind of think, well, I'm, I'm being Jesus in the community, but at the same time we start to actually let too much of the community or the ethos, the ways of the community, to seep into us. And suddenly one day, how does your time get promoted and you've got a choice to make? I hope that makes sense. <clears throat> we may be Christians, but what else are we accommodating? We're in a season of talking about preparation, and in particular preparing the heart at the moment. And one of the challenges to me and to all of us is to ask the question, what else are we accommodating in our hearts? What are we accommodating that is in conflict with what God is wanting to do in us? So, I want to just talk briefly about how we can avoid having what I'm calling a divided heart. How to avoid having a divided heart. And the first of those things has already come up this morning. The first thing you have to do is to make Jesus Lord. Now, <clears throat> I want you to think about that. The word Lord, in more common parlance, might be boss. Who is in charge of your life? Now, Trevor's already talked this morning about, a couple of times actually, about if you've, you're not a follower of Jesus, you might say, well, I'm Lord of my life. <laughs> or something else is Lord of my life, but not Jesus particularly. And that's a choice that you're being challenged to make, I suppose, or to make that decision about who is in charge of your life, who's boss of your life. But even as Christians, we can very happily live saying that Jesus is Lord while somebody else is on the throne i.e. me, yours truly. Just making our own decisions, doing what we want to do, as if being a Christian is a lifestyle decision instead of a life-changing choice. Being a Christian will be exceedingly inconvenient at times. <clears throat> Maybe even scary. But that's a choice that you make. I'm really not interested in being a Christian if it's just part of being a club where I can have a membership and come to meetings. You know. Unfortunately, in the story that Sonia read, David was boss. In those situations, he was calling the shots. He was making the decisions. He was doing what he wanted to do. Even though if he'd stopped and thought for even two minutes about his course of action he could probably quite easily have concluded that he was going down the wrong path. So 
So, first thing, make a decision of the will. Make Jesus boss. A decision that all of us need to make. Second thing, if you've made that decision, the next thing is to bring your life in line with your decision. See, making Jesus Lord isn't just something you do in a meeting or once off and then you carry on living just the same as before. Making Jesus Lord means that you're going to make changes with God's help and the help of others to your life. So, for example, I would say start adopting healthy practices. You know, eat more fruit. <laughs> Spend time in prayer, talking to God and listening to him. Read the Bible, read the word of God and all the other stuff that's out there to help you do that. Um, Worship him. Spend time with him. There's, There's lots and lots of different practices. Trevor made reference to in the last couple of times he's spoken. Can you put up Proverbs 4, please, Michael? I'm getting you a lot, a lot of mentions today. Trevor used this verse in his um, introduction, his, his um, article at the beginning of the weekly news this week. He made reference to this. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. And all the healthy practices we talk about in terms of reading the Bible, praying and spending time with God, all of those things help us to guard our heart. <clears throat> You know you have to keep your garden weeded? Well, actually, these days, they tell you to let stuff grow, don't they? For the bees and the hoverflies and all that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm a fan of that. Sonia isn't a fan of that. <laughs> to her, a garden is looking good if it's neat and tidy. To me, it's colour and life. But I do know you need to remove the weeds from around your precious plants. Because weeds will compete for moisture and nutrients. So if you've got a nice apple tree in an orchard, you might just want to clear the bit of... Most of us haven't got orchards. I appreciate that. I haven't got an orchard. Let's say <clears throat> your cabbage plants, whatever it happens to be. Clear the weeds around your cabbage plants. When you get home today, it's the first thing you need to do. Serious point is, if you allow stuff like weeds in your garden they will mean the plant will not grow as well as it could. And it's the same if we accommodate the rubbish, the weeds in our life. Our lives would probably be okay, but we will not grow anything like we could. We will never reach our potential. And some of those weeds weeds are deep-rooted. It's not good just pull off the flower heads. You need to get down and get out the roots. (coughs) Dandelions being a case in point. So, To avoid having a divided heart, you need to make Jesus Lord, boss. We need to bring our life in line with those that choice to start making good decisions. And the other thing I want to mention is to say, ask for help. You don't have to do this alone. It's really tough to do it alone. God has put you into a family, a church family I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about two adults, two kids. I just mean any group of people that God has brought together is a family. And you are my church family and I appreciate you very much. <clears throat> but we're here to support, encourage and help each other. Ask the Holy Spirit. I mean, it sounds obvious. But the Holy Spirit, one of the names of the Holy Spirit is the helper. He is here to help. And he's not doing it from next, stood next to me. He lives within me if I'm a child of God, if I've made Jesus Lord. Perhaps Dan will edit out all these pauses when he puts it online, I don't know. <clears throat> Consider what it means to be a disciple. We're disciples of Jesus, aren't we? Oh, is that a trick question? (laughs) We're called to be disciples. We're not called to be believers. 
we're called to be disciples, you can believe a lot of things. I can believe that Huddersfield Town are amazing, but if I never go to watch them, what's that, you know? So to be a follower of Jesus is to be <coughs> a disciple of Jesus, and sometimes that means making ourselves accountable to somebody else who will disciple us, will help us, support us, encourage us. We just make ourselves accountable to each other. The script, scripture talks about confessing our sins to one another. To think, well, what, does that mean go to confession? No, it just means that there's an openness, there's an honesty, where we can actually say to somebody else, look, I'm struggling with this. Will you stand with me? Will you pray with me? Will you challenge me when you see me slipping up again? <clears throat> Do we make an accountability to each other? So, be a disciple, stay teachable. You've always got something to learn. Doesn't matter how long you've been around or how much you think you know. Stay open to learning more. Make Jesus Lord of your life. Make him the boss. Bring your life in line with that decision. Make good decisions. And then get help when you need it. This last verse I want to show you is an amazing promise from scripture. And it's Jesus' words himself from Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. How is that for a motivation to have an undivided heart. Lord, I want, to, I want to see you. I don't even know what I'm praying, but I want to see you. I want to see you more. In whatever way, Lord, that you can show me, whatever I can take without my head exploding or my heart exploding, Lord, I want to see you. <clears throat> if that is your desire, to see God, to see more of God, well, then there's a challenge in this verse. We need to have pure, clean, undivided, unblended hearts. Okay, I realise that's uh, sobering, but it's good to be challenged sometime. For this morning, right now, can I just ask you to just close your eyes? And the reason for that is so there's no distraction from people around you. I'm just going to mention a few things, and what I'm asking you to do, please, is just to really think about your personal response to what I'm saying. First thing I want to ask you to consider is this question. Is Jesus truly Lord of your life? second thing I want to say is be honest be honest with yourself at best David was in denial and God had to send a prophet Nathan to challenge him so be really honest you might say I want Jesus to be Lord of my life I declare him to be Lord of my life but I recognize there's this in my life that cannot stay there and then lastly I want to encourage you simply to repent by which I mean say sorry to God it's very simple and turn to him for his forgiveness and his help Okay, thank you for doing that. And then, <coughs> just an encouragement I've said before, if you need to, get help. If, if you had a, the conviction of something inside which is just too big for you to deal with on your own, ask for help. Um, don't kid yourself over something that's been a re it's come up and you've got forgiveness, come up, got forgiveness, gone on for years possibly. Don't kid yourself. Be honest with yourself. Just get some help. Go to a trusted friend or a leader here in the church family and just get somebody to stand with you and help you. I'd like us to conclude by praying together. So if you can, would you just stand up, please? <clears throat> Michael's going to put a couple of Bible verses up and we're going to use those verses and we're going to read them out loud together. Um, yeah, can do. <coughs> 
So if you can put up the first one. So the, the first two verses <coughs> are from the very end of Psalm 139. And then when we've read those together, make this a, a corporate prayer, we'll also read Psalm 51 verse 10, which is the creating me a clean heart verse. Okay? So let's read this together. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Amen. Amen. Thank you.